It's the All NL East team on today's podcast. I'm going to give you the top players at each position in the NL East. We're also going to dive into the farm systems in the division as well. Where do the Braves stack up against their division rivals? Let's find out today on today's episode of Locked On Braves. So let's get into it. This is Stacy Gotsoulias, DC Lundberg, Ryan Finkelstein, Taylor Blake Ward, host of Locked On Yankees, Locked On Mariners, Locked On Mets, Locked On Angels, and you're listening to Locked On Braves. Locked On Braves. Locked On Braves. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hey, and welcome back to Locked On Braves, brought to you by the Locked On Podcast Network, where we talk about your favorite teams every day. I am your host, Jake Mastriani. You can follow me on Twitter at shortstopball. Check out my bio there to see everywhere I am covering the game of baseball, including the Atlanta Braves in written form over at tomahawktake.com. Also cover AA South for Prospects 1500 and the Birmingham Barons for Southside Sox. So go there, check out my work as well. Also, make sure you follow the podcast on Twitter at LockedOn underscore Brave so that you can be a part of the show and subscribe to us on YouTube as well. Very appreciative of all the support there. And thanks for making Lockdown Braves your first listen each and every day. Right now, we're posting episodes three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Hopefully, this lockout's going to end this week. I'll talk a little bit about that later. We'll get back to having a podcast every single day day so all the braves uh, talk that you could ever ask for right here on locked on braves before we get into today's episode let me remind you that this episode is brought to you by bet online bet online has you covered this season with more props odds and lines than ever before bet online where the game starts so the inspiration for today's podcast comes from follower vt00 murdoch on Twitter, who had asked about doing an all NL East team and also had asked about ranking or talking about some of the prospects in the NL East. So it's going to be a very NL East centric podcast here. Um, not so much about the Braves, but more so just talking about their rivals. So I want to give you my all NL East team position by position. We'll do starters and bullpen as well. And then we'll get into some of the best prospects in the of the farm system in the division as well and then we'll touch on the cba at the end of this is going to be a big week in baseball but let's start out talking about my all nl east team um which i think is a very fun exercise uh to do and to see where the braves kind of rank in some of these positions the catcher position i honestly didn't even really look at this i think it's pretty clearly jt real muto i mean he's one of the best all-around catchers in the league defensively offensively he's going to play you know 140 games a year um, so i think that's a pretty easy decision there uh, jt real muto is the best catcher in the nl east and that brings us to first base uh, which if we're going by and i i, I did this basically by fan graphs depth charts right now and freddie freeman is not at first base for the raves on the depth chart at the moment so first base is a little bit wide open Obviously, if the Braves sign Freddie Freeman, he is the best first baseman in the division and quite possibly all of baseball as well. But I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with B. Alonzo here. Um, this is a close call. You could really pick Alonzo, Hoskins, or Josh Bell here. Uh, I probably would have it was really more between um Alonzo and Reese Hoskins. I think Reese Hoskins is really big in what he does and key for that Phillies offense. When he went down at the end of last year, that really just tanked that Phillies team. So I, I wouldn't be mad at you here if you wanted to pick Reese Hoskins. I went with Pete Alonso going with the power there at first base. Um, but it is pretty, when you take Freddie Freeman out, it's pretty competitive there with some really good hitters in Alonzo, Hoskins, and Bell. Uh, but I went with Alonzo giving him the nod at first base. But let me know your thoughts on if Freddie Freeman's not back, you know, and who knows who the Braves gets to replace them. Who is the best first baseman in the NL East? I think it becomes kind of wide open at that point. Second base is another one I didn't even really look at. It's Ozzy Albies for me. I mean, I don't think there's 
really much denying that. I think he's one of the best second basemen in all of baseball, you know, top five, at least in my opinion. Uh, we still see top tens out there that for some reason don't have Ozzy Albies in them, and I don't understand that at all. Uh, but I think he's clearly the best second baseman in the NL East for sure. So the Braves get one on the board at second base. Shortstop was a tough one. Um, it should be easy. It should be Francisco Lindor, and that is who I I took. Um, somewhat assuming 2021 was a down year for him, and he'll bounce back in 2022. But not a lot of great shortstops in the NL East. I mean, you could very easily go Dansby Swanson here with the season that Francisco Lindor had in 2021, and I, I could understand that. But I do think it's Lindor. I think he'll bounce back in 2022. I uh, would love to see Dansby push him. I think he is second in the NL East right now in terms of shortstops. Uh, I would put Dansby second there, but give Lindor the nod at shortstop. At third base is Austin Riley. And, man, what a difference a year makes. Um, but he is clearly the best third baseman in the division for me right now. We'll see how that plays out, if he can back that up in 2022 and, and continue to be the best third baseman. But I think he is very clearly that at this moment. And, again, you put – the Braves signed Freddie Freeman, and you look at that infield, which we know was incredible last year. I mean, I think the Braves could very easily sweep the all NL East infield team um, with Freeman, Ozzie, Dansby, and Riley. So um, Braves get Freddie Freeman back, and they may have the, the infield locked up in the NL East. Move it to the outfield. It's quite cl clearly Juan Soto in left field and Ronald Acuna Jr. in right field, two of the best players in all of baseball. And when you look at center field, it's actually a new addition. Well, I guess Marte has been part of the Marlins, but Starling Marte is the best center fielder in the NL East. I don't really consider him a center fielder. I know he's probably going to play the position. I think he's more of a corner outfielder. But there's not a lot of great center fielders in the division right now either. I mean, I know you can – I mean, Ronald could technically play center field. You could ship things around that way. But we're thinking, you know, primary – center fielders, guys who are going to play center field the most, uh, I'd give the edge to Starling Marte, who I love, and I love that signing for the Mets, unfortunately. But I do think I'd put Starling Marte there right now. But let me know if you think there's a more proper center fielder in the NL East right now other than Starling Marte. All right, going to the pitching side of things, a lot of really good pitching in the NL East. Obviously, Jacob DeGrom is starting pitcher number one, you know, if he's healthy. And I think Max Scherzer is starting pitcher number two. Look, when he's healthy, he is still really good. I mean, look at the numbers from last year. I mean, he still is a really good pitcher. So I got both Mets pitchers, one and two here, and then got Zach Wheeler coming in at the three spot. You know, obviously a, a Cy Young worthy season last year for Zach Wheeler. Could have very easily given it to him. Obviously, Corbin Burns deserved it and won it, but I think Zach Wheeler had a very strong case. And then starting pitcher number four, I got Sandy Alcantara for the Miami Marlins coming off an incredible year. And we're going to talk about that Marlins uh, system here in a minute and the pitching that they have coming through. Uh, Sandy is going to lead the charge there. And then I got Max Freed uh, as the fifth starter here. I mean, you could you could put Max anywhere from three to five on this list. I mean, you could probably put him anywhere two to five. Um, but you know, obviously I think he deserves to be in this top five and I think Morton would have been my, my sixth starter. So, um, again, the Braves have two very good starters that just won the world series. So, you know, obviously they deserve recognition in the all NL East team. I definitely think Max Freed should be in here and Morton is very close. Again, he'd be right there as that sixth starter for me at the moment. And then looking at the bullpen, not a ton of great closers in the NL East. Um, I think you could, with the closer, you could either go with Edwin Diaz or Will Smith. You know, they both had very similar numbers last year. I'd probably would, I probably would give the edge to Diaz. I don't know. It's really, really close. Um, but I'd probably give it to him. And, you know, you put Will Smith there as a, a setup. Um, and then I got Tyler Matzik in there as well. Corey Knabel with the Phillies, Trevor May with the Mets, and Luke Jackson and AJ Minter with the Braves for my all NL East bullpen so very fun exercise there putting that together let me know your thoughts please comment down and below on youtube or on twitter as well let me know you're all nl east team you disagree with some of my selections here but just to run down it again i have real muto at catcher alonzo at first base albies at second 
Lindor at short, Riley at third base, Soto in left, Marte in center, Acuna in right, and then on the pitching side, DeGrom, Scherzer, Wheeler, Alcantara, and Freed in the rotation. And then in the bullpen, Diaz, Smith, Matzik, Knable, May, Jackson, and Minter. So let me know your thoughts on that all NL East team. Let me know who you would put in there for your all NL East team. And of course, still got some offseason work to be done. So players could be added. Hopefully, at least one big one in Freddie Freeman is added. But as things stand right now, that is my all NL East team. This is the time of year I've pretty much given up on all my New Year's resolutions, but not this year. I'm sticking to my resolution to eat right thanks to Built Bar. It almost feels like it's not a resolution at all because I actually enjoy eating Built Bars. And have you tried their puffs? If you haven't, you're missing out on one of Built Bar's best tasting bars. Puffs are the first ever protein infused marshmallow. They're fluffy, they're marshmallowy, they're not just a protein bar, they're a treat, and they're covered in 100% real chocolate. All Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. Yes, that's 100% real chocolate on all Built Bars. Low calorie, high protein, replace your candy bar with these. They are better. A typical candy bar can be anywhere from 200 to 300 calories, but most Built Bars contain just 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, and new for this month is the white chocolate cookies and cream. They're all delicious, and new flavors are coming out all the time. If they think the flavor might be good, they'll make it. It will be delicious, and it will be good for you as well. So go to Built.com, use our promo code LOCKED15, and get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. This episode is also brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing number of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the, all the parts that you will need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing the only brand their warehouse happens to carry? You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home in your pocket where you can do the exact same thing. Save time and money when using a Rock Auto. Why choose to spend 30, 50, even 100% more for the exact same parts at a chain store or new car dealership? Rock Auto is a family business serving do it yourselfers for over 20 years. Rock Auto prices are reliably low for every customer. They have everything you can need from brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, and even a new carpet. Go explore their easy-to-use website today to find the solution to your auto parts needs. Go to rockauto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck. And while you're there, write Locked On in there. How did you hear about us, Box? So they know that we sent you amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. All right, so transitioning from current major league players in the NL East, where you are, we are going to look at some of the top prospects in the NL East. Obviously, as Braves fans, Braves listeners, you know about their farm system. If you don't, go back. I gave you my top 10 with some honorable mentions as well for the Braves farm system on a previous podcast. Um, but I'm mainly going to be focusing on the rest of the NL East on today's podcast. and talking about the farm system rankings for the division. And looking at uh, Kylie McDaniel's farm system rankings on ESPN, there are not a lot of great farm systems in the NL East. In fact, the, the Marlins are the only one in the top 15 as they came in fourth on Kylie McDaniel's list. Then it was the Mets at 18, the Nats at 22, the Phillies at 24, and the Braves at 27, which I think is too low, but obviously we're a little biased here on Locked On Braves, but I don't think the Braves have the worst farm system in this division. But regardless, there aren't a great, great, a lot of great farm systems here. Um, obviously, the Marlins have been rebuilding for years. It makes sense for them to have the best farm system. The Braves just unloaded their farm system to win a World Series, so it makes makes sense that theirs would be down right now. But I don't think it's quite as down as, as Kylie McDaniel seems to think. Um, but Let's get into some of the prospects here, and we'll we'll go by the rankings that Kylie had on ESPN. And the Marlins, look, they have pitching for days, and we've already seen you know one wave of that start to come up. Let's talked about Sandy Alcantara earlier, um, but they have Max Meyer coming, Edward Cabrera, Yuri Perez. We've already seen Sixto Sanchez and 
you know, if he gets back healthy and right, he's just going to be another piece of that starting rotation. They have a ton of starting pitching. It's not that much different than the Braves rebuild. And the Braves rebuild, they just continue to add pitching prospect after pitching prospect, knowing not all of them would hit, but hoping that some of them would. And they lucked out and got Max Fried and Mike Soroka and Ian Anderson to help build up the top of that rotation. And that's what the Marlins are looking to do as well. The difference for the Braves is they got some big finds on offense as well with Acuna, with Albies. You know, they already had Freeman and with Riley. They got some big prospects that came up offensively to really help boost that side of things. And that's going to be what the Marlins key will be if they are going to start competing for championships. And they got a steal in last year's draft and shortstop Khalil Watson, who somehow fell to them at 16. They really need their former top prospect or former top pick in J.J. Blade to step up in 2022. Had a good second half of 2021, but the former Vanderbilt uh, outfielder really needs to get going. He has to be that big piece to help kind of carry that offense because that's going to be the key for the, the Marlins. They're going to have the pitching. You know, Can they get some prospects to come up on the offensive th- side of things to carry them? Not a ton right now that I see coming up. You know, Watson's obviously years away, but today's the closest one to being, you know, that major impact middle of the order bat. Uh, but 2022 will be a big year for him. But the pitching is there. They are going to be elite pitching for some years to come. Next is the Mets, and they're the exact opposite. Not a lot of pitching in that farm system. I do like JT Ginn as kind of an, a possible upside arm in the starting rotation if he can stay healthy, which was a problem for him when he was at Mississippi State. But they got some big bats at the top and catcher Francisco Alvarez and third baseman Brett Beatty and shortstop Ronnie Mauricio. Um, Three bats at the top of their farm system that are really exciting. Could be big impact bats coming up. They did trade away one of their top prospects in Pete Crow Armstrong, who was a first-round pick a couple years ago. They traded him this past offseason for Javi Baez and trevor williams so they're going to trade from their their farm system for sure uh, that's not going to hold them back as they try to compete and win now so you could see even more players traded away from this farm system but as it stands right now they do have some pretty solid prospects at the top there who could become impact bats here pretty soon looking at the nationals this was not a very good farm system and it, it still isn't as i talked about at the top But they quickly made some big improvements this past season when they traded Trey Turner and Max Scherzer to the Dodgers for Kybert Ruiz, Josiah Gray, Gerardo Carrillo, and Donovan Casey. Now, Gray's already graduated, not a prospect anymore. We got to see him a couple of times against the Braves. Very good young arm. Likely will be a big part of that starting rotation for years to come. And Kybert Ruiz looks like he's going to be a very solid catcher as well. He won't be a prospect much longer Um, so he'll be graduating here pretty soon and behind them there's a couple of of really big big prospects and Cade Cavalli who led all minor leaguers with 175 strikeouts last year so big arm did struggle a little bit once he got up to triple a so we'll see you know how he does to start 2022 but he could be part of the Nationals rotation soon Nationals are trying to turn this thing around quickly because they want to try to build another winner around Juan Soto for however long he's going to be around. It's reported that he already turned down a 300 plus million dollar uh, extension from the Nationals. So who knows how much longer they're going to have them, but the prospects they're getting and that they traded for, they're trying to turn this thing around quickly. And then they also got Brady House. And I talked about Watson being a steal for the Marlins at 16. Uh, Brady House was considered a steal for the Nats at 11. So, again, a lot of people considered him to be one of the top prep bats in the draft last year. He kind of fell, you know, at the end a little bit, but still a very good player for the Nationals. Could turn out to be the best uh, prospect from that draft. Would not be surprising at all. And then the Phillies, to me, this is the worst system in the division. However, I do like shortstop Bryson Stott. I think he will be a very big impact bat, more so a hitter than a than power, but I do like him. And I think he could be up this year for the Phillies. If Mick Abel can stay healthy, he could still be a top of the rotation arm. 
A lot of people are high on Johan Rojas. I have not actually put my eyes on him myself, so I can't really comment too much on him, but he is a top prospect in their system according to most outlets. But I like Stott. I think he could be a very solid impact bat. I think he's going to hit. I definitely think he has the hit tool to succeed. And again, I think he could be the Philly shortstop at some time in 2022. So that is the, the NL East farm system. Again, not a lot of great systems there. Um, I would probably rank the Braves third in this system. Um, I'd put them behind the Marlins and, and the Mets. I'd put them right there with the Nationals probably. I think the Phillies have the worst system in the division. And I don't think the Nats is that great either, especially once Ruiz uh, graduates here pretty soon in the 2022 season. But let me know your thoughts on the NL East prospects. If you're listening as a Mets fan or a Phillies fan or, Mar or Marlins or Nationals, you know you obviously know your systems better than I do. So let me know some names that we should be keeping an eye on. Football might be over for this season, but basketball is in full swing with both pro and college hoops. From all the latest odds, totals, player performances, props to where the next fired coach is going to land, BetOnline.net is the number one spot for all your sports betting needs. BetOnline remains the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, and news of the season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline.net is your source for hockey, boxing, and UFC odds right to the Olympic coverage and information. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. BetOnline, where the game starts. So I wanted to briefly mention this upcoming week for Major League Baseball because it is a huge week for the sport. Obviously, the owners have set in place a February 28th deadline in order to start the regular season on time. That means they got to get they got to start making progress this week, if not get a deal done this week. And it sounds like both sides are committed to that, committed to potentially getting together every day, which. I don't understand why they haven't been doing that from the beginning, but you know, this is really what many people thought is that they needed to wait until there was a deadline or there was the possibility of missing games for things to really happen. And we are now at that point. So get it done, make something happen, get a deal done. This is a huge week for the sport. They're scheduled to meet Monday afternoon for the first time this week. And again, sounds like they will continue to meet every day until hopefully they get a deal done. Just quickly to go over some of the biggest issues. Seems like the player's biggest issue seems to be around the CBT threshold, which, again, I still don't understand why that's such a big deal for the players, but it is, and there's been very little movement there. Um, the structure and money for the bonus pool. They've agreed on a bonus pool for pre r players, which is huge, and, and I think that should be considered a big win for the players that the owners have agreed to that. Now it's just deciding the parameters of who – um, who gets that money and the money uh, that goes into that pool. And then the league minimum as well, which I think they're close on. I know they're pretty far off in money, players being at like 750 and the owners at 630. Um, but I think they can come to some middle ground there, hopefully. Um, but those are the three of the biggest issues right now that need to get worked out. I am optimistic a deal will get done. This week, uh, I'm going to say a deal's done by Friday. If they actually do what they say they're going to do and get together every day and not get together for just 15 minutes, but they get together in a room, try to negotiate these things and work work them out, I think we'll get a deal done by Friday. And let's hope that's the case. That will do it for this episode of Locked On Braves. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Locked On underscore Braves. You can follow me at Shortstop Ball. Also, make sure that you rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast. and we will talk to you next time.